Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to IAB Europe's Industry Insider. Uh, we host these insider webinars with members to share their latest research, reports, or advancements that help drive and shape our industry. And today we are delighted to have Group M join us. Uh, their presentation will be on navigating brand safety in 2020 and beyond, which is probably one of the most applicable webinars you will attend given the uh, current times that we're in. Um, before we start, I'm just going to run you through the agenda before I hand over to Stefan. So let me just do this one. Stefan will be giving a presentation that he's assured me will be no longer than 15 minutes on the brand safety playbook that Group M have just released. And then following the presentation, we are delighted to have an expert panel from the world of CTV, audio, gaming. So we have Natalia, Rack and Emma that will be joining Stefan for, a present, for the panel discussion at the end. Um, as with all of the webinars that IB Europe hosts, this is live. Um, it's being recorded and we will share with everyone afterwards. So because it's live, we do encourage you to submit your questions that um, can be put to the panel. So at the bottom of the screen, you will see that there's a Q&A interface. Please put your questions in there. Some people also put them into the chat box and then Stefan will moderate those questions at the very end. So I'm going to hand over to Stefan and uh, thank you for hosting this webinar with us today. Thank you, Helen, and thanks everyone for joining. I think Helen, you'll have to stop sharing this your screen. Oh, there it is. Before I share my own. I hope everybody can see my screen and confirm. Yes, we can. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stavar Angelovic. Uh, that Angelovic sometimes is a bit complicated for people to pronounce, so people sometimes call me Stavar Grupham. Uh, pleased to present to you uh, more about brand safety in 2020 uh, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, brand safety, this particular webinar and everything that we will be speaking today is based on, on the report that we have issued, Grupham has issued uh, earlier in the, in the, in the year. So, um, Brand safety as a topic uh, will become and is actually already such a hot topic for the uh, for the industry. What remains, however, as the topic is very is very vast and complex, there is one thing that remains our north star, which is that that the best way to manage brand safety is actually by investing in quality. And what quality for us at Group M in principle means is that those are the, that is the inventory that is viewable seen by real humans within the target audience, served in a safe, suitable environment and fraud free. Um, another thing that it, again and again is something that is confirmed is that quality delivers better performance. However, while we are discussing today about quality in the established media and programmatic, etc., and that we have ways to measure, benchmark and optimize, there are some old media that are reinventing themselves through digitalization and that are uh, gaining more and more traction, not, uh, not only among the audience, but also uh, among the brands, which effectively means that there are new risk areas in, in those. Today, we will be discussing a bit, not only during this presentation, but uh, with the panel about those uh, old media reinventing and new media uh, uh, and the old challenges. The report that, that I just mentioned speaks mostly about the, the, the 10 key takeaways. Those 10 takeaways are, um, are the, the, the topics that we believe will dominate and will continue dominating the brand safety conversation. One is policy shifts. We have all heard about GDPR and then there is the CCPA and there are many acronyms around the world which, uh, which signify some, some, some kind of a privacy data protection legislation. Um, what this means is that the legislation that is being adopted around the world just has a ripple effect on the uh, on what is happening in our industry. Not only that we change our practices, but for example, one of the things that we are seeing is the decline of, of cookies. What that means is that uh, we may be we will have reduced ability to reach uh, target audiences, but that is probably not the most problematic part of it. Is uh, that our ability to measure will probably be significantly 
uh, significantly affected. Then uh, the second uh, key point is uh, the pandemic that we all lived through. Pandemic um, is, uh, has brought people more online. Uh, and what that means is that people are also diversifying channels they're engaging with. People listen more to audio, they play games more, and that means that brands will want to reach them through those, through those channels. And then that, again, means that there are risks that we have to address in those channels. Fake news. I'll speak more about, uh, I have a full slide on, on this, but fake news and disinformation or misinformation, depends how you, how you label it, uh, is, is becoming more and more important, especially during elections and as we see as the industry is moving also towards more uh, uh, ethical handling of things. Um, another key point, and I'm sure Emma will have a, a word or two to say about this, uh, is the too much brand safety topic. Um, sometimes we have taken it so uh, we have taken it too far, blocking uh, trusted news uh, publishers or uh, publications uh, targeting diverse groups by blocking keywords which shouldn't have been blocked. Uh, and then we have, as I said, you remember that I mentioned those old channels that are now being reinvented. We are, I was speaking about TV, which is now connected TV, and digital out of home. So we are seeing uh, programmatic entering this, uh, this space. And what this means is that, uh, that we will have to find a way to mitigate uh, those risks. However, that is not only limited to, um, uh, to uh, TV and digital out of home. We have audio uh, as, as well as we have digital broadcasting and then music streaming and then podcasts. So all of every single one of these uh, uh, channels and opportunities carries a certain uh, certain due diligence that we all have to undertake. And then we also have, uh, we have a gaming. Uh, but as I said at the, at the beginning, what really remains our true North Star is the fundamentals still matter. Investing in quality uh, is, a, is basically a proxy in investing in brand safe, uh, in brand safe environment and uh, those environments that are going to deliver better performance also for, uh, for your brand. Uh, now, let's go a bit into the, into the details of, of, of some of those challenges. The number, the number one uh, challenge that we wanted to speak today about is our deep fakes. So we all know about online disinformation and we all know that what it is. However, what we, we are going to increasingly see is the phenomenon of deep, of, of deep fakes. Somebody can take uh, this video of today of me, put it through the, through the algorithm, and they can make it appear as if I said something I would have never said. Obviously, in my case, that may not have been an issue because I won't bring down the markets, uh, but there are people and uh, lots of actually people if their images and their videos are manipulated, they can present uh, they can present a serious danger not only for the society but for the uh, for uh, brands themselves. We will see how we will address this in the future. Um, one of the things that uh, industries mulling about is about processing certain types of data. Again, there are certain ethical considerations that we have to put into into that as well. Too much brand safety. Uh, I already spoke about uh, about uh, about this, but as I said, um, what what has been happening is that uh, sometimes the tools that we have uh, to prevent from ads from uh, being displayed in uh, unsuitable or non-brand safe environments have been used not in a fully appropriate way, so that we have been blocking uh, some of the some of the content that shouldn't have been blocked. And uh, by taking out, and also we, we have been demonetizing some of the some of the content and content creators that we shouldn't we shouldn't have. But I do believe that the industry has been addressing this, and we will hear more from Emma later whether these uh, this has been successful. Now let's take a, a closer look at key opportunities uh, for improved brand safety measures in specific media, and we start with uh, with with audio. So. Audio uh, in 2020 uh, is, uh, is likely to experience 20% of growth in digital uh, audio ad spend, and maybe Rock can tell us whether this is uh, how truthful this is. Uh, but what is true for any other uh, medium is true in audio as well. Context matters. Some popular music genres have songs featuring explicit lyrics, and while obviously this is a matter of suitability, some brands may want to 
uh, may want to avoid this kind of content. Uh, equally, some podcasts may host edgier or more provocative content, um, and uh, etc. The 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 issue and the challenge really that we have with uh, with audio today and others is that those three basic principles of measure, benchmark, and optimize are not always available because the the actual cross industry standards. Uh, either are at the very early stages, or they are not implemented by they're not implemented by uh, by everyone. So when we think about audio and where we would like audio to be, is uh, one day this is again from Group M perspective, we would really like to see full cross-platform standardization, more robust third-party verification, and horizontal integration of inventory offering. Because today there is lots of fragmentation, which means um, also uh, less, uh, less available measurements sometimes in those cases. Uh, here you will also see some of the recommendations that Group M has put forward on how to, for the moment, best um, tackle those challenges, which always revolve around uh, doing appropriate due diligence, uh, ensuring that you have uh, appropriate uh, legal measures in place and implementing those of uh, those uh, technologies that are available to you uh, in the in the moment all while working with industry bodies on standardization and uh, and spreading of best practice uh, in terms of gaming uh, i believe gaming has really exploded and uh, while i'm i'm personally not a gamer i i have lots of friends who have uh, who have engaged in game in the gaming world during uh, during the confinement and even before um, and you, there, there is really a, a variety of, uh, of sections that, and statistics that tell us about gaming. So here you see that 86% of global internet users report they play games on at least one device. Um, you, there are certain considerations for brand safety in gaming. One is fragmentation of the experience across devices, platforms, and publishers. So you can play in-app, you can play in-console, yet again in-app. It depends also on the device uh, and etc. And again, there is a lack of standards for measurement. Um, there is also an issue of suitability and safety of game plays, because while the game uh, as such may appear to be to be safe, the actual interaction of humans with the game produces sometimes user-generated content that is not always the most appropriate for, for, every, for every brand. And one thing that is not here on the slide is children protection. Many of, many of our clients uh, want, want to, and they are also legally obliged not to target children. So that's one of the ways, that's one of, uh, one of the things that you really have to pay attention when engaging uh, with, uh, with gaming. Again, um, how to address these issues is full cross-platform standardization of measurement and content metrics. And especially because in-game uh, advertising is a 3D environment, we need new technologies that are going to be able to assess not only the ability, but fraud and, and other things in that particular in environment. Um, in, the, in the actual playbook that we released, you will find uh, the checklist for gaming, how you can engage with different gaming companies and different gaming uh, inventory uh, by implementing simple, simple checks that are going to reduce that brand safety risk. So to conclude, there will always be an element of, of risk, particularly related to user-generated content. This information uh, will continue to thrive by finding new avenues. Privacy debates and other regulation uh, uh, debates will not be concluded and we will really have to address the measurement challenge. Um, what I just presented is really just a fraction of the report because I didn't want to spend the entire one hour speaking about it. Uh, but you can, you can uh, scan this QR code and you will be taken to a page where you can download the, 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 full, uh, the full report. What I really find interesting is the QR traditionally is not something that many people have used, but with the pandemics, it really found it's, it's, uh, it's having a comeback. Uh, in, a, in a way. And uh, to, to conclude once again, um, brands, and I think we, we saw this during the last couple of months, discussions uh, in, around brand safety has shifted not only in keeping brands safe, but also keeping users safe and keeping the society safe. 
Um, so our final message is that brands must not focus only on protecting themselves, rather they must seize the moment as an opportunity to form more valuable connections uh, with, uh, uh, with people. Having said that, I'd like to thank you um, and I'd like to introduce the, the, the panel. So today uh, with me, we have uh, Natalia Vasilieva, who is the VP of Marketing and Anzu, uh, at Anzu, an in-game company. Natalia will tell us a bit more uh, about, about the company a bit later. We have Virak Patel from Spotify, Head of Sales for UK and Panemia, Iraq. Um, and we have Emma Callahan, uh, Sales Director from Reach Solutions. And I have to say, and this is what I told them at the preparatory call, I'm very happy that I ha that we have a mix of brand safety and sales uh, salespeople on the call because sometimes these two perspectives uh, can uh, you know they, they really yield interesting discussions. So thank you very much uh, for for joining. Um, the first question I have for you is: uh, brand safety means really a lot of things to a lot of people, and I would like to hear what does it mean to you, Emma? Maybe we can start with you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, apologies as well that I'm dialing in on my phone. This is the first day since we went into lockdown that my broadband has failed me. So I hope you can hear me and see me all right. Um, so I guess as a publisher, and you alluded to this, Stefan, um, brand safety is something we take really seriously, but you know, current advertiser approaches mean that we feel like we probably miss out on a great deal of, of content. and. Uh, at REACH, we reach over 47 million people in the UK every month. Um, we report on lots of important issues. We set the cultural agenda. We hold the government to account. Uh, we expose the bad guys. But often we will be excluded from ad campaigns for doing that. And uh, a lot of our most engaging and popular content can often be deemed as unsafe. Um, and this, as, as many of you I'm sure will know, will be down to, um, you know, blanket keyword blocking and exclusion lists. Um, we've done a lot of work around this as a business and we found that up to 75% of content uh, gets blocked using strategies based on keyword blocking. Um, but actually at Reach, only 10 to 15% of our content, and we've worked with Google and lots of partners on this, is actually deemed um, unbrand safe. Um, and I guess we also benefit from being a publisher that has thousands of journalists uh, professionally creating content every single day. Um, and it's this combination of human touch uh, alongside technology, um, which we rely on to ensure that we will be brand safe for our advertisers. Um, and, and the challenge around keyword blocking actually led to us creating Mantis. Um, Mantis is our brand safety um, and contextual tool um, we've designed it not just to aid reach, but actually for all publishers um, to implement a more intelligent and an AI led brand strategy. Um, and what Mantis does is it understands exactly what our content or publishers content is covering. So a good example might be um, sport, which is a really significant vertical for us at reach um, story about footballers shooting at goal. Uh, is perfectly safe content and actually we would say very valuable content to a lot of advertisers, but that, that will be blocked um, because of shooting. Um, and there are so many examples of this. And what Mantis does is it analyzes the entire article. Um, so it understands real word language and the semantics of the pages that we publish. Um, and it's immediate, it operates at CMS level. So it analyzes the brand safety of all of our pages before the content goes live. Um, which gives us the confidence that, you know, any Mantis inventory is 100% safe and suitable. Um, right. So I think we'll talk about Mantis a lot more, so I'll wrap up. Okay. But um, I guess as a publisher, and especially working in breaking news, we do struggle a bit with existing kind of brand safety attitudes, and we would love the chance to work with advertisers and agencies more closely to, to find solutions on this. Great. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on, on Mantis a bit later and keyboard blocking. Uh, but uh, Natalia, uh, in gaming, what, what would you take, uh, what would be your definition of, of brand safety? 
Um, hi everyone, first of all, thank you for joining the, the super important Brand Safety U webinar today. And I'll be happy to share my thoughts and our stand in terms of brand safety and what it means for gaming. Uh, luckily, gaming is considered to be a pretty brand safe environment um, compared to other traditional media like social, for example. First of all, because there is um, not that much user generated content or not user generated content at all, which means that brands and advertisers can actually control the environment they're in. They can pre approve um, the game at first, they can even pre approve the specific placement where they want to appear and sometimes even the specific moment in the game that might be associated with a positive thing that would give them the right effect the advertiser would want to achieve. Um, and yeah, like for sure ad advertisers uh, have always been uh, cautious about brand safety and they keep on asking questions even in terms of gaming and here we need to uh, separate between mobile which is not that uh, you know, <laughs> brand safe and um, um, super user friendly and the rest of the platforms um, that are considered to be premium, such as a PC and consoles. And these okay. are places that are uh, super brand safe and that's what we keep on saying advertisers. As a company, as an ad tech provider, Anzu has always taken brand safety seriously and we do our best to make sure that advertisers feel comfortable and they are sure that their advertisements appear in the, um, in the appropriate con in the context, I would say. Thank you, Natalia. And I think later on, we'll be speaking a bit more about the concept of suitability, particularly applied to, uh, to, to gaming and rock. Um, what about what about audio? What do you what do you see as brand safety in audio? And uh, maybe you can also tell us a bit more about are we actually switching and moving from safety to quality? Yeah, of course. Well, firstly, Stefan, don't change your surname to Stefan Groupen by <laughs> Depol. Um, and I know there's a nice ring to it, but you know, keep keep with what you have. And secondly, for everyone that's listening, it is the solar system above my head, which has been above my head now for almost six months. So um, I need to get that out of the way to to start off with. Um, so look, you know, at Spotify, we we deal in trust. You know, I'm sure many of you and hopefully uh, many of you are on the Spotify platform. You know, we, we are that relationship we have with each of our consumers is really sacrosanct. It's really critical because, you know, we understand um, through clearly listening uh, habits that you have, you know, what you're doing and how you're feeling. Now, if at any point we break that trust, then that's, you know, that's our business model at stake right and that's that relationship we have with with each of our consumers so we really sort of start there and you know as, as you're all as you all know every uh, consumer that's on our platform is logged in so we already have that sort of understanding of each of our, our consumers so when we then think about brand safety or any form of safety you know it's all coming from that place of really understanding the consumer and, and knowing what the consumer is all about now within the audio space and I know you sort of touched on it there around verification and it being nascent you know what I'd say there again you know clearly for, with our platform people being logged in our consumers or we call them our fans our fans being logged in does take away quite a bit of the, the risk that you may well have you know from a brand safety perspective um, but you touched on and alluded on podcasts now podcast is exploding at the moment I'm sure M has a brilliant podcast strategy as well and and, and every other uh, publisher and platform that's out there um, but it is you know it is nascent and it's a bit wild west like and you know one of the things that we're looking at is introducing those tools and verification tools that you know modern day digital marketeer absolutely needs so you know whether that's around you know, any form of verification measurement effectiveness and and so on so you know that's something we're very excited about but you know we we recognize we need to bring that into the podca podcast sphere um so that you know brands feel comfortable to obviously um, use those platforms Speaking of brands, and I'll ask you one more question while we're at, um, what do brands usually ask you when it comes to brand safety and, and audio in general, but also particularly Spotify? Yeah, of course. Well, I, th I think one of the things is, you know, where, where it starts, I, w I wouldn't say, and I know this is a, a wonderful brand safety webinar right now, but I wouldn't say that's the first thing at the top of a brief that comes through from, you know, how, we, how we're obviously talking to brands. It's a clearly a really important table stake for sure, in terms of, you know, ensuring a brand can be on our platform. So, you know, we, we from our perspective, and, and I'm sure others will be in the same place, need to tick those boxes, for sure. Um, what we do get asked is clearly that audience behavior and insight, right? That's the critical bit, because, and, and 
primarily well not primarily but over the last six months as you know consumer behaviors really changed that 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 is at the heart of you know what comes our way for sure um but you know brand safety is critical and you know it's it, but i do think it's a table stake you have to be a brand safe platform or environment or publisher in order for a brand to really uh, use your use your platform yeah thank you and natalia about in gaming what is one question that they always ask when they engage with them, so? Um, well, for sure, brand safety is always, it's not, it's also, as Rack mentioned, it's not number one question, but uh, advertisers always ask about it in this or that way. I would say that for gaming, it's blood, bloody games, violence in the games that, uh, you know, it, it used to be a super blocker uh, even half a year ago, but, First, because of COVID, because of the gaming acceleration, because of the evolving attitudes towards gaming and better understanding that uh, bloody games, and I would not call them bloody games, these are just shooters, yeah, or um, games that have a kind of violence are kind of pop culture. And you can't mm. do anything about this. So if you want to be part of this phenomenon, you just need to accept it. And let's also remember about Fortnite that is actually also a kind of shooter but, you know, it's not about the vertical you're into. It's about how you play with it. And, yeah. Like, so it's about, so effectively, it's about suitability for, uh, for a brand, while not exactly. every brand. Yeah, right. Then coming back to brand safety, uh, becoming the uh, table stakes. True, completely true. Yeah, everybody wants the environment to be brand safe, the game to be brand safe. Um, but advertisers have taken a new approach towards it and they think more about suitability. It's, it's mm -hmm. a bit more than just, you know, the, the environment, tick, brand safe. No, it's about whether my game, oh, sorry, whether my ad is suitable for this specific game. Do I appear in the appropriate environmental context? And um, I see this as a kind of evolution. And I'm happy that, you know, we've been shifting from brand safety to something uh, more complex that brand suitability is. And it's relevant to gaming. But there is still brand safety floor to maintain. Right. It's, uh, uh, right. it's... <laughs> yeah, brand safety, then hmm, what's next? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think, Emma, the, the suitability concept is very close to your heart and the considerations that, uh, uh, at, uh, at REACH and uh, I know you, you already told us a bit more about, uh, about Mantis and we see actually lots of publishers being more and more engaged in a similar way. Do you, do you feel that that is the, the future in a way of publishers taking more on, on, on board in terms of them labeling their content accordingly so the brands can accordingly then uh, buy what is suitable? Yeah, I mean, I, I really agree with what Rack and Natalia have said as well. I mean, it is you know, it is table stake. And I agree that actually the briefs that come into us, you know, it's a given that we will have to answer them in a brand safe way. That's an absolute given. And, you know, we, we're, we've, we're taking steps with, with Mantis to make sure that, you know, we're positioning ourselves and for other publishers in the best possible way to always ensure that. Um, I guess, I, you know, I would kind of, given what uh, Natalia was talking about with Fortnite and violent games, the interesting thing for me is, I feel like we still need to really get to grips with what advertisers really truly want um, in some ways, because you might see a brand that's happy to sponsor a very violent TV show, but wouldn't want to run on a breaking news story. And there's just quite, you know, it's about really understanding how that works. Like when, when is that violent content actually okay and suitable? When is it not? And for us as, publisher, as a publisher, I think it's really trying to understand that as much as we can to then develop and deliver the solutions that are going to be effective for those advertisers. I, I can respond to that. I, I think it's a, I think there is no one size fits all really. And I agree. every brand will have their own uh, determinations and how they engage. And also I think more and more we switch to this, uh, to the industry, to the industry developed uh, gradation of a low, medium and high risk buys 
uh, more and more opportunities will be there for you to to um, you know to to monetize more your content and uh, and for brands actually to to be able to do that. Uh, but uh, since you're speaking about um, about about risk, one of the really major risks today is disinformation. And uh, how, yeah. what do you think? What do you think? How can publishers help fight disinformation? Trusted publishers such as yourself, you know, who, as you said, have thousands of journalists on on the ground. Yeah. So I think it's one of the kind of scariest things that's happening in our industry, that kind of spread of unhelpful or untrue information, which can cause um, panic, fear, hate, you know. Um, interestingly for us, since the, since the pandemic, we've actually seen a 9% increase in trust in our content uh, because people have come to us for that professionally curated information at a time of crisis, you know. Whereas we've seen that social media has decreased around 13%. So, you know, as a publisher, our role is to continually um, inform and educate people, um, you know, and that's not just as reach, but the entire news industry. And there'll be lots of people that don't always agree with the opinions of that content, but that is what the free press is there for. And we provide those high quality trusted environments um, at reach across national and regional. Um, we know not all, everything we publish will be brand safe as well. You know, there will be, there is obviously content that is not suitable. Um, and that's part of what we do. There is a lot of news that is uncomfortable and upsetting. Um, but ultimately people come to us to engage with us because they trust we'll give them the truth. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we need to put faith and trust into quality journalism. We need to hold fake news story producers to account. We need to educate uh, them and advertisers on how that can create fear and panic and why we shouldn't support it. Um, and, you know, while social media obviously plays a hugely important and significant role in our society today, um, you know, it's remembering that media platforms and publishers are also vital in, in terms of keeping the public accurately informed. Um, it's, it's our duty, basically, and, you know, we're governed by Ipso to do that for that reason. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and Natalia, I'd like to get back to, to gaming a bit. Uh, we, uh, in our preparation, we also spoke about how game developers are addressing this and when they're actually developing games that they're paying attention to, uh, to safety in a way, not only users, but also advertisers. So I'd be curious if you could tell us more about that as well. Sure. Um, well, in terms of gaming and brand safety, I would say that it's applied and it's important to both advertisers and game developers. And I'll tell you why. Um, basically, both want to keep their end users happy, right? Advertisers want their audiences to be uh, first to see them and then to, to be happy and to have the um, positive sentiment in terms of the ad that they saw. It's even more crucial uh, for the game developers because you know, these are their uh, like main audience gamers, right? They're the people that play their games and they make everything possible to please them and to make sure that gamers are comfortable with what's going on uh, in the gameplay. I wouldn't say that game developers develop games with the single thought, oh, is it brand safe? Oh, <laughs> like how can I mm -hmm. make sure that uh, my game would be brand safe for this or that advertiser? But they definitely started to think about advertising as a relevant and viable monetization channel and in-game in specific. And then what's important for them in, uh, while developing games is to make sure that the ad placements are suitable and attractive to advertisers. And that's uh, what big um, game studios have always been doing. And I think the shift uh, to free to play or the shift to in-game advertising across environments, not only mobile, but also mm -hmm. across PC and console also leads to this, you know, a kind of shift in mindset and way of thinking in terms of whether my game is relevant and suitable for advertising. Got it. Uh, Rak, were you, were you reaching for Neptune there? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Always too far in the distance, Stefan. <laughs> um, uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning um, uh, podcasts and uh, the measurement challenge around podcasts. Would you, uh, would you be able to elaborate uh, on, on that and in general on the availability of, of third-party verification and what's being done? Yeah, that? of course. So, you know, look, firstly, the podcast space is massively exciting it really is you know and clearly you, you follow the consumer and where consumers are and you know podcast is now a mainstay for a vast majority of consumers not just in this market and, and in others um now one of the difficulties obviously with podcasts is it's very different to a uh you know a three minute song or a piece of um uh, code that's coming from you know another form of content play and so on it can vary in its size scale what's in it what content's in it and so on so you know one of the things that we actually launched at ces gosh ces feels like a lifetime ago doesn't it um back in january is it's called streaming ad insertion and what that basically is is providing um advertisers on on spotify those those various tools around measurements and, and effectiveness because we're able to do that on our owned and operated content and as you've probably all seen you know we've, we've got a uh, yeah we've been making various announcements around original content that we're bringing onto the platform from you michelle obama's to mm -hmm. uh, joe rogan and, and so on so you know we are huge Usually excited about that because I think what that then opens up is you know what, what obviously this webinar is all about you know a, a brand feels you know feels that we're in an environment where you know um, it, there's not going to be a negative backlash um, either on their brand or you know or their company and, and and so on and I think that's probably the bit which is one of the final jigsaw pieces for for podcasts to really sort of take off to where we'd like it to. I think one of the one of the things that we uh, that people always forget some, somehow is that um, in the in the brand safety space, what the most important thing is the actual control for advertisers that they feel in control of yeah. where their ads appear. Um, speaking of which, I know that uh, on in in general. Uh, there are some songs that might not always align with the brand's value due to, due to various things such as profanity, the subject matter, or the lyrical content. Uh, but those, that kind of songs have a very valuable audience following. How do you ensure that brands reach these audiences and stay safe when advertising in these environments? Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely come on to that. But I think the first thing that you said there is, is the super critical one, right? You know, giving brands confidence and control, actually, of, you know, where their content can appear uh, in, you know, in understanding the context of the environment it's going to be in. Understanding, you know, from our perspective, we know how people are feeling based upon the playlists that they're listening to. Uh, you know, we, uh, we have tens of thousands of playlists on the platform that are just for breakups. Now, whether a brand wants to be around breakup, uh, content maybe not that might not be where they want to be but we you know we provide all of that type of insight to a brand and their agencies so that they you know they have that control uh, on on you know um, to where their brand's going to appear now um in terms of you know what what we what sort of content we have on our platform and you reference profanity and, and so on. You know, one of our missions is very much around supporting the artist community. And, you know, it's their art that's on our platform, whether that's music or podcast or, you know, the spoken word and so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't want to limit that, right? So we're not going to come out and suddenly say, right, you know, no more profanity, you know, in any of your songs or in any of your podcasts. I mean, that's just not the right thing for us to do. But, you know, because we want to support artists so that they can, you know, they can live off their art. You know, and that's not just the superstars, but, you know, the millions of artists that we have on our platform um, and therefore you know we we um, have that content on our platform but we give advertisers the control and obviously you know groups like yourself around where that brand uh, will appear so absolutely you know if a brand wants to steer away from certain types of content we can absolutely do that for them and for our consumers as well you know if a consumer doesn't want to hear profanity or use that as an example then you know we have all of, of those controls uh, within the platform too yeah, I, I, because I, I obviously listen to Spotify uh, oh, a you. lot. <laughs> You're welcome. Since 2011, I believe. Amazing. So, um, so you know, I, I've I've noticed as uh, as uh, as well the, that sometimes the, there can be profanity. So it, uh, it just popped to to my mind. Um, Emma, a question for you. We've seen also apart from brand some brand safety practices. Um, uh, blocking uh, trusted news publications. We've also seen that uh, publications that, uh, that target diverse audiences have also been blocked and excluded uh, from, uh, from media strategies due to too strict 
uh, brand safety practices. We as a group, we have issued guidance across the clients, you know, we encourage to uh, encourage clients to move away from keyword blocking and go for a sentiment targeting or, uh, or just to support uh, such uh, directly such uh, such publications through marketplaces diversity diversity marketplaces etc so just wondering from your conversations with publishers yeah um, what do you what would be your message to brands what can brands and we as agencies do better yeah so um i think it's a really good question and couldn't be more relevant really than now but um from a reach perspective uh, given what happened over the last few months we saw lots of examples of brands um, blocking our coverage of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which, can't, which you know, feels completely wrong. This news was incredibly significant and important. And we were creating huge amounts of content, which was actually around advising and educating people to really understand. Um, and so, you know, it definitely is not right that our, our brands, our advertisers, for our audiences as well, that that content is, is blocked because um, it's so important. Um, so I know I keep banging on about it, but Mantis, again, we, we, we've kind of evolved Mantis this year to really try and tackle that. So mm -hmm. uh, you, can tell, you can tell I'm the salesperson in this, can't you? <laughs> um, um, but we actually, we've used Mantis to power um, the Brand Advance Network, um, and that specializes in reaching diverse audiences at scale. So it basically allows advertisers and brands to uh, reach, reach these audiences um, without audience pixel targeting. Um, and as you, as you referenced, sadly, a lot of this kind of content has been blocked in the past, commonly words such as lesbian, gay, Muslim, race, racism. So again, you know, the advice is the first place to start is, is that kind of keyword um, blocking or exclusion list. And then, you know, to, to utilize brand safety tools that, that can specialize in this area. Um, I guess the last thing just to quickly add on that is that we've actually recently launched an initiative um, across all of our newsrooms to, um, we're gonna pay for young new journalists from um, diverse backgrounds. So um, in terms of ethnicity and in terms of um, social class, we're gonna pay for them to come into reach. And I guess, I hope that advertisers see a commitment to us understanding that we need to um, we need to commit to diversity. We've got we've got some way to go, but we we want to recognise that we need to represent our audience in the UK, and ultimately, hopefully, advertisers will deem that to also be valuable. Can, can I can I just a little Absolutely. add on onto what Emma just said there around you know. Um, getting to these environments and so on because I think absolutely a brand with the right message in an environment you know uh, these sort of environments that we're talking about is so powerful um, and and you know what one of the things that we've definitely done and I know Em and her team have done too is you know speaking to brands about what should their creative message be as well I think this is a critical point because look you can have all the checks and balances in place but if the ad is jarring and you know and and then suddenly is not respective of you know what that uh, consumer is either reading or listening to or watching and, and so on then you know brand safe it doesn't matter how brand safe it is does it really because that impact that you'll have then right so you know I know you know the the, the stronger organizations are absolutely working with brands and their creatives in particular around having you know um, the right messaging in these environments because they can be so powerful they really can and not just about shifting products but actually you know getting um you know these are very worthy causes for sure and, and i know a lot of brands in particular are, are really leaning that way absolutely and i think one of the things we actually we uh, always i think number one in our checklist is uh, be sensible and uh, uh, with with your uh, with your creative because it has to and also be genuine um, yeah. because it, it may, if it appears, if an ad appears not genuine um, while presenting and while arguing for a cause and for a purpose, it, um, it can cause really a significant uh, backlash, uh, which is, you know, you can argue whether it's a brand safety risk or not. I would argue it is, but yeah. yeah. Um, right. In any case, uh, we have, uh, we've got a few questions from the, from the audience. Uh, so I'll, I'll go first to you, Natalia, we actually have two questions for you. One is, um, um, there is, I'll just read it out loud. It says, my client has a specific hesitation around gaming content due to incentivized ad watching, which means that somebody has to watch, has to watch an ad for additional lives or tokens, etc. Um, what is your, 
what are your thoughts on this type of, uh, of, ad, of advertising? That's a great question that actually a lot of advertisers think about. Um, I think the, um, the answer would be the reaction of gamers, first of all. And uh, uh, stats uh, claim that 70%, around 70% of gamers would prefer incentivized or rewarded ads rather than in-app purchases or paid um, app which means that, first of all, the gamers are quite happy with it. And um, what I can say, I know that it's super, super popular, especially uh, in the mobile world. And um, again, that's because of uh, game developers who want to make money and uh, uh, keep their um, gamers happy. And that's a kind of compromise. I would say that this kind of incentivized um, ads or rewarded ads can be built in a uh, like different way yeah first of all and that's rule number one if the user doesn't want it he or she can still should still proceed with the game yeah so it's not mm -hmm. like oh my, God, my game is blocked for 24 hours because i don't want to uh, watch an ad right so that's number one so that they have an opt out like a gentle one and number two, and uh, actually that's where Anzu comes into play, rewarded ads can be different. And uh, since we are talking about uh, in-game ads that are super blended into the gameplay, this can also be a kind of uh, a survey yeah, that, that the gamer needs to uh, like, uh, undergo or answer a few questions and get a few additional kicks for another life. So for example, I'm Pepsi. I want to understand uh, whether consumers want a diet Pepsi or a regular one. And I introduced the survey, yeah? And I tell the gamers, hey, do you want to take a, a mm -hmm. look at the survey and get another five keeps, kicks or you'll need to, I don't know, to spend uh, some time without it or just, you know, lose the game and um, proceed from scratch. So what I'm driving at, um, the, this kind of monetization is not good or bad. It's about the implementation. And users are quite positive about this. So why not in terms of the client? Uh, the client just needs to define the right ways to, to make sure uh, that the, the concept and the ad work. So it can be seamlessly integrated in a, in a way. Um, Emma, we've got a question. Uh, what's your take on exclusion lists? How often do we need to update them given the, the frequent trend in, in news, uh, a change in trends in news? But I think the message was don't always use the keyword uh, exclusion list. Uh, uh, well, obviously, depending on the, on the, risk, uh, on the risk level. So I would, I would actually rephrase this question maybe to you and ask you, have you seen the decline in keyword blocking uh, since this issue has, uh, has, you know, been at the forefront of our industry's thinking for the past, I would say, three to four months. Have you seen an improvement? Um, I think we have, um, we have through testing Mantis. So we have like advertisers that have come back who have been really pleased with how that has worked for them. Um, and I think that it's a combination of the two things. It's assessing those, those, those exclu the exclusion lists and then um, you know when it was interesting when we went into lockdown so um, our traffic went through the absolute roof because people were um, desperately searching about coronavirus I mean it seems like a, another world away now doesn't it when we first sort of went into that that state but I remember I you know you were just desperate to know what was going on um, and the, the challenge we had with that was that no advertisers wanted to be around coronavirus content mm. um, and there was no other news. So we had no other content. So um, we worked with Mantis to set up a COVID safe marketplace, which basically would um, pull out stories about NHS clapping or um, how to homeschool or important government information. And, uh, and it would basically um, you know, I think we, we managed to unlock about 43% of, um, of more inventory because of that overnight. So I think you've just got, it's a combination of those, of, of, of those things, definitely. I can bet you that everybody's Googling now Mantis after, after your intervention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and to end on a light note, as we enter in Q4, what is your North Star professionally and personally? Rock, maybe you can take this COVID one. vaccine. COVID <laughs> vaccine. Please, come on. <laughs> we, all, we all hope for it. Yeah, I don't know whether we're going to get it for Q4. Um, no, I, do, do you know what? I, th I think um, clearly over the space of the last sort of six months, you know, the, the phrase getting back to normal, I think is, you know, that's probably out the window a little bit. You know, there's, there's forms of normality that will stay with us you know, over the space of the next year and so on. So I suppose what I'm excited about as a North Star is, you know, how, how does our business and how do our team sort of continually adapt to that? Because, you know, there's no V. I don't think there's even a... A shallow L or whatever you want to sort of you know call it here so you know uh, that that continual sort of evolution of, of 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 the state we're in of the ad market we're in and you know I think the partner ecosystem becomes really critical then actually because we're all in this together and and you know we are all you know aiming to do the same thing yeah Thank and you. the COVID vaccine <laughs> fingers crossed yeah. Natalia what about you um I totally agree in terms of the vaccine <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's a super rough time for everyone, right? As Rack put it, like, um, we just need to get used to the new normal. And it's so difficult to make plans now. And everybody knows in the advertising space that Q4 is super busy, right? So with the planning for the next year and all the new year and stuff and all of the super hot season uh, for advertising. So we look forward to this. Um, in like uh, taking into consideration the COVID situation and what's going on beyond it. So you can't plan anything. You need just to go with the flow and be super flexible and agile. And I think that's, you know, the new North Star for the upcoming months until we have the COVID vaccine. Couldn't agree more. And you, Emma? I mean, I'm not sure how much I can add to that. I totally agree to both. I'd also like functioning broadband back, please. <laughs> <laughs> You've done all right on phone. Don't worry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love, I love this humble, uh, humble and uh, uh, humble desires. Um, in any case, I'd like to, uh, to first of all, actually, I'd like uh, to give a little clarification. I'm at my insurance offices. That's why my insurance uh, uh, logo is behind me. But all group images are very close to my heart. No worries. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I did think, have you got that at home? You know, have you, have you got, you know, this, no. this is above your mantelpiece or something? No, no, no. Every, in every room I have, you know, my insurance. Of course, rightly so, rightly so. so. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rak, Natalia and Emma so much uh, for your participation. I'd like to thank also IB Europe team, uh, Helen and Marie-Claire, uh, in particular for helping and the group emptying Mahmed and, and Amanda on, uh, on making this uh, happen. So uh, we hope you all enjoyed it and uh, we'll definitely share the the actual recording of the of the webinar later with you so have a have a lovely tuesday evening it's tuesday yes sometimes you forget <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you bye bye, -bye.